Uh, we got our guests, man. We got them. We do. We got them. We got them. Hey, uh, step inside the Hall of Fame um, from NXT, uh, NXT star right now. He's managing um, the Out the Mud Man, uh, two bad, bad boys, Nima and Price. Welcome in right now to the show, my main man, Scripps. What's up, man? What's up? What's up, fellas? How you guys doing? Hey, man, we're doing good, man. We're doing real good, man. I just wanted to get you inside the Hall of Fame, get a little champagne wishes, a little caviar dreams. You know what? You know how it is, man. <laughs> By the time we leave today, everybody's going to be intoxicated um, of some, some Hall of Fame action. But no, man, you got a, you got a very interesting story, man. Um, that's why I want to you know, get you in and, and talk to you a little bit because, you know, kind of like myself, um, you came up the hard way. Uh, and, and the thing is, people can see you on television, you know, on a weekly basis and they can think, oh, man, he's got a silver spoon. And he, he came up with it. He got it all. You know, but for me, um, I, I, I always say, man, I know what it's like um, to, to live with the lights off. I know what it's like, you know, to, you know, you know, have you know rats and roaches running around. You know what I mean? So everything I got, man, it's like a blessing. And then to hear your story. Um, it definitely, um, I, I think it's something that, you know, some young man, um, some young female out there, they need to hear it uh, more more than anything because just like on the, uh, you know, the movie uh, Beowulf, you know, they say, you know, give this man a gold piece. He has a story to tell. <laughs> <laughs> Big facts, book. Big facts. No, but man, but talk to me, man, about your your upbringing, man, uh, because it's uh, like I said, it's definitely touching. So let me. I'm gonna say this first, book. How real can we get on this podcast? We get all the way real, man. We get all the way funky, funky, like they say, huh? We're gonna get real. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, we're gonna pull this, uh, pull some layers back, most definitely. So uh, I'm originally from St. Louis, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, Midwest boy. Born and raised. Um, I'm one of eight. One of eight. I got four sisters and three brothers. Raised by a single grandmother. Uh, my, my mom died when I was three years old uh, from drug abuse. And I never knew my dad. The only thing I heard about my dad was from people around the neighborhood and some family members. They just told me that he was a big drug dealer. Big drug dealer and he had people take their clothes off to come into his house. But I never met him. I never met him, didn't know anything about him, but that's the that's the full extent of what I know about my parents. Mom drug dealer, dad, my mom drug abuser, dad drug dealer. But um, by the grace of God, my grandmother, she raised all eight of us. She didn't let us go into the system. She kept us all together. And she had just finished raising, you know, six kids of her own. All her kids were grown. And then she just started over and she said, I'm not going to let none of my kids go into the system. They're they going to keep them with me. And so I commend her for that. And, you know, you know what it's like growing up with as, as kids, we think was nothing. But we had the most important thing was family. We had each other. We had always had food on our table. We may have some shacks on our feet, some Reeboks, but we had clothes on our um, on our backs and shoes on our feet. And so, like I said, I, I, don't, I don't really know how she did it, but she did it. She made it work and she worked around the clock so that we had those essential things right there. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but you know, keeping the family together, that was just part one. Uh, it was no, no cure, no medicine for me following in the footsteps of my brothers and my uncles and many, many guys in the neighborhood. And, you know, people see me in OTM right now and they say, man, how are we supposed to take Reggie serious? He was a sommelier doing backflips and now he... Now he hood and now he gangster, but we ain't buying this. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> y'all don't really know that what I'm doing right now, this Scripps character, this is more, this is a lot closer to home than anything I've done before. That Reggie yeah, character, yeah. sommelier, French and acrobatics, all that's that's a part of me. But born and raised, St. Louis, this script character, this Scripps character, it's it's pretty close to home. I mean, yeah. yeah. I, 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 me personally, um, I, um, I definitely, um, uh, uh, we got something in common because I'm the, I'm the youngest of eight as well. You know, uh, it's four boys, four girls as well. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, uh, so, so I get it, man. But how tough was it, man? Because I remember, uh, 
you know, when my mother passed away when I was 13 years old, um, you know, me and my sister, you know, uh, she's a couple of years older than I am. We were orphaned at that time and we didn't, we didn't have anybody but ourselves to hold on to. I remember being in that house, you know, when the lights got turned off. I remember when the water got turned off, you know what I mean? Uh, I mean it was some hard, hard times. I mean, it really was some hard times. Um, how hard was the struggle um, for your grandmother being, you know, in that position, raising, you know, all the kids? <clears throat> so the very interesting thing about my family, we don't, we never showed affection to each other. So my grandmother never talked about the struggle. And as kids, we didn't know about struggle. We just knew what we was experiencing and it was normal to us. And so like things like not having a father was normal. Things with not having a mom, not saying mom, not saying dad, it was normal. And yeah. my grandmother, bless her heart, she always had food in the house and it was eight of us. And so those food, that gross, those groceries come and they're gone quick. So she had put these huge padlocks on the cabinets and the uh, fridge. <laughs> she was like, nah, not today. I'm not taking all this food. And um, so that's it, it was just, that was life. And my grandmother, she's a very strong woman, but she never showed emotion. We never showed emotion to each other. I didn't grow up saying I love you to my brothers. We didn't hug each other. We didn't, we didn't like say these words of affirmation, these beautiful words or whatever. We just knew that oh, you got a problem with uh, what's the name from around the corner? Let's go. Let's go handle that. So we knew yeah. that we loved each other by how we showed uh, like, like physicality. I always had my sister's back and we had each other's back and things like that. And so like it was tough, but being in it, you don't know what's tough or what's not. You just know yeah. this is life. I didn't know yeah. that my life was difficult and different until I stepped outside of that circle. Yeah. Start experiencing a lot of different things in life, and that's when the real struggles became like yeah. evident for me. I um I always say it um, when I was a kid, you know, growing up, and, and the way I used to rationale it um, was: you never miss what you never had, but you miss it. You miss it. You know what I mean? You just you know you you just got to put yourself in that mode. You know what I mean? Uh, of course. Um, you know, and to, to actually, you know, that's that survival uh, mechanism that kicks in, you yep. know, to help you help you get to that next level. Um, man, I didn't know wh what I was going to do uh, when I was coming up as a kid. Um, I quit school, of course, went to prison, whatnot. And I was just trying to f figure out how to find myself. How would you um, how would you find yourself and uh, say, man, I don't want to fall in those pitfalls. I know I didn't want to fall, fall in those pitfalls. I saw the drugs. I saw the, the pimps and prostitutes. I saw all of that stuff. And I didn't I didn't I didn't want to be that. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew I, did, I knew I didn't want to be that, even though I st still end up going to prison. I still knew when, even when I was behind bars, I was like, man, this is not me. I'm like, I don't like this <laughs> to get up out of here. How did you find yourself and in, in not, you know, fall into those pitfalls? Man, excuse me. Booker, when I tell you this journey is so long and so so bumpy, I, I at a young age, at a young age, and I, when I when I say young, I'm talking about six or seven. I knew exactly where my life was headed. I had the only males in my family were drug dealers, gang members, and uh, they're just D boys. And so automatically, I said, "Oh, this is what my life is supposed to be." I had some teachers and like the fourth grade asked me what I want to be with my life. And, you know, we gave the little vague answers, football player, basketball player, rapper, all kids from where we come from. They say those three things because we don't know anything else. And so I just assumed that my life would be the exact same life that my brothers were living. But then, um, and I was actually okay with that because I didn't see another way of living. But then I met, I went to this uh, program called, um, called, um, Life Stones, Live for Life Academy. It was something like that. I can't remember it. Remember it. And uh, it was a program for high-risk youth. And they basically took us to this facility after school. We stayed there for like, 10, like two hours or whatever after school. And after the five or eight weeks or whatever it was, we were assigned these mentors. And I got this older white woman. Older white woman. And they would say, oh, you have to spend 10 weeks, um, 10 hours for 10 weeks with your uh, student. I said, all right, cool. So I spent the time with her. She started coming to my school. 
immediately I was embarrassed because I had this white woman come to my school around all my black friends and I'm in a predominantly black neighborhood. So we don't have anyone else outside of our race in our community. So that was a target to be picked on. And so after the first two weeks, I said, no, nah, I don't want to be bothered with you. Can you let's just discontinue our relationship right now? But that was the first person that never gave up on me. After I pushed her to the side, she came back to my school saying, why does he, he want me in his life? All the kids were picking on him from having a mentor. And so she said, all right, let's meet up after school. She meet, I mean, meet up on the weekends. And so she like asked me, like, what do you like to do? And I said, in very shy little voice, I like to flip. And she would just watch me flip in the gymnasium, go to like different places and watch me flip or whatever. And then she took me to a circus at 11 years old. And oh, what oh hold it right there, hold it right there. We gotta take a quick break. Okay. Uh, 11 years old is when it pretty much all started. Hey guys, stick around. You're in the Hall of Fame, man. We got scripts. We'll be back in a second. And it's Booker T, six-time world champion, my man Brad Gilmore for Manscaped. The performance package 5.0 Ultra is here. And let me tell you, it's got futuristic tendencies included in this bundle, guys. Brand new lawnmower 5.0 Ultra, the weed whacker. 2.0 ear and nose and hair trimmer and essentials aftercare products like the crop soother, the ball after shave lotion, and the crop preserver, anti chafing ball deodorant, and two free gifts. Oh, yes! That's right, Book. Their fifth generation lawnmower features two interchangeable next gen skin safe blade heads, a standard one for taking a little off the top, and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. And did I mention it's waterproof too? Manscaped, they did us a favor, Book. All the listeners of the Hall of Fame, and they threw in two free gifts the Boxers 2.0, and the Shed 2.0 toiletry bag. Resolutions may come and go, but a well-groomed you is here to stay with Manscaped's latest and greatest. Yeah, and start the new year off right, because when you look good, you feel good. Manscaped help you sculpt the best version of yourself for the year ahead. New year and new you and definitely a new trimmer. Manscaped got your grooming resolutions covered. Guys, get 20% off and free shipping with the code Booker at Manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at Manscaped.com. Use the code Booker. Happy New Year to your balls. Boom. Welcome back inside the Hall of Fame. We got scripts in the highs, man. Um, talking about life. Um, somebody out there listening to this definitely um, can get something out of this because you just never know. You just never know um, who's been in that same position that you've been in and how you can draw that from that, draw that inspiration uh, more, more than anything. Uh, but uh, talk to me, like you said, it started when you was 11 years old when everything pretty much changed for you. Yeah, she took me to my first circus show at 11 years old. I was, it was on Grand and Del Mar. It was a white and red big circus tent, big chapiteau. toe. And uh, you know how it is. When something is introduced that's new, that's different, that you don't know anything about, you immediately withdraw from it. And that's what I did. She took me in. I'm watching the shows. I see like a bunch of clowns, animals. I smell like horse poop and all of this stuff. I'm just like, man, what is this? I'm like watching this, very uncomfortable. And uh, she saw my face and she said, are you okay? I said, no, nah, I'm just very uncomfortable being here. Can we leave? And she said, are you sure? I said, yeah, I, I really want to leave this place. And we left. But what I didn't know, she was taking me there to meet up with a, uh, a woman named Jessica Hentoff. And she was the head acrobatic coach for a group called the St. Louis Arches. It was a group that uh, compiled a bunch of kids all around St. Louis and they main focused uh was acrobatics and whatnot. But I walked out on that blessing because I was so close-minded, like so many of us are uh, from me from. So fast forward, it's like four, three or four months later, I went to the city museum, the home of the St. Louis Arches. And I saw this ring with a bunch of like tumbling mats on there. So I just run in and started flipping. And then some uh, coach come out and say, hey, you can't flip here unless you're a student. I say, well, how do I become a student? Because all I want to do is flip. He gave me these paperwork, his paperwork. I signed it up. 
Then I did a 10 week like circus patchwork class. It was called patchwork, 10 week circus class. We trained for nine weeks and then a 10th week we put on a show. And Booker, that was probably the most fun I've ever had in my life. I was first time in my life, 11 years old, I was able to be a kid doing something that I actually enjoyed doing. Didn't have to worry about no guns, no gangs, no, no drugs, no violence, no judging or nothing. So I did that show. And then Jessica come to me and she said, hey, you are very good. Would you like to be a part of our troop called the St. Louis Archers? I said, what is this troop and what do they do? So it's our advanced acrobatic group and you get paid. When she said that, I'm like, oh, I can get paid for doing flips. Sign me up. So that was the beginning of like my circus journey, circus career. And, you know, I was probably in like the fourth, fifth grade, some, somewhere around there. And that journey was just bumpy because trying to fit in and be someone else outside of school in my neighborhood. Yeah. Being this circus performer, doing something that I absolutely had no clue what it was, but I fell in love with it. I uh, found a whole new meaning of life, but I couldn't be the same person in my uh, neighborhood. How'd you, yeah, that's what I was just going to say. How'd your boys look at you, you know, wanting to do that? Because that's that's what I got when I when I start wrestling. I used to like sneak over to the other side of town and wrestle with the white guys. <laughs> 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 you know, and they all were like, man, that stuff's stupid. Man, you ain't going to do anything with that. You know, it was, it was, that's, I got that kind of hate. Um, how'd your boys feel about you, uh, you know, trying to better yourself? So I had one homeboy, my best friend, uh, his name's Sean Jones. Uh, we got real close in middle school. He was the only one from my neighborhood that was from my area that was cool with it because he was a positive dude. He wasn't a positive dude, but he was he was the man. But he was the only one that uh, that really like saw that I was doing something positive. Everyone else, pfft, are you clown? Are you are you you gay? Excuse my words. He was like you, you gay wearing these tight. Uh, leotards and tights and whatever you uh, you fruitcake you a monkey all of these different things I'm like dang I really had to deal with that when I went back to the uh, my neighborhood so it was either I go against the grain or I go with the flow so throughout middle school and high school it was I do circus in the summer school start I quit play basketball be a banger and then once everything like hit rock bottom I go back to circus because I knew that when I had circus, they gave me the thing that uh, I needed most. And that was time away from my normal life. The most time, I, the more time I spent in the circus, the less time I spent on the street. But trying to balance those two out, it was tough. I got into many fights because I was called these names. Um, I, I did care what people think uh, thought about me. I mean, without even trying to be in the streets, I was the younger brother of two gang members. My older brother, yeah, Demetrius, yeah. was known for fighting. And my other brother, uh, Rodney, he was known for stealing cars. So they called him Ride Out and called my brother Knockout King. And they called me Lil Skunker. They called me, because they called my brother Ride Out Skunker as well, Skunker Boy. They called me Lil Skunker. So I'm like, I mean, I can't get away from that life. because I have to go back and sleep in those neighborhoods and whatnot. But once high school started, I mean, you really couldn't tell me nothing, Booker. I was leaving the house at 6 o'clock in the morning as if I was going to school, going to the homeboy crib, playing Madden. And when I did go to school, I'm just shooting dice, skipping class, playing basketball. It was bad. It was real bad. And I didn't have that. Um... Let me rewind. Just one important thing when I was younger. This is when I found out Circus was uh, becoming my, more my real family than my actual family. My uncle. Yeah. Uh, like you said, wrestling wasn't cool when we were younger. And I used to watch wrestling with my uncle. His name was Miles. And it wasn't cool. But when I was a kid, he was the coolest guy in the, in the city. He had all the money, had all the women. He had all the respect. And he would watch wrestling with me. And so for me, I'm like, oh, people don't like wrestling. They can say what they want to say, but he the man. So we that's, that was our thing. And uh, I remember he got he got killed in my bedroom. He got his face blown off with a shotgun. I see his bed, I see his fingers blown off and his, and his, he just twitching. And next to my bed, my bunk bed, the leg was covered in his blood. And um, I'm, I'm what, 13 years old, 13, 14 years old. And I dealt with that for like a month. I couldn't, for like two weeks, I couldn't sleep in my room. 
And um, my circus coach, she took me to her house and she let me stay with her until everything kind of like died, died down. And uh, she would take me from like the complete opposite end of the city to the north side to school every morning, pick me up and things like that. And she wasn't a big fan of wrestling or fighting or whatever. So she never let me watch it in, my, in her house. But when I got back, I tried to turn the TV on and watch um, uh, Monday or Thursday, whatever, SmackDown or I don't know which one. When I turned it on, I had this, 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 this feeling in my stomach. And I, I couldn't fathom to watch wrestling because the only thing that I had with my uncle was we watch wrestling together on Mondays and Thursdays. And so once that happened, I stopped watching wrestling because it was too painful. The coolest guy that I knew that watched wrestling with me, he's gone. So it was no wrestling, no circus. It was back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then my junior year, I got into a game fight. And that sent me rock bottom. I... I, I didn't spend a lot of time in prison, but I got, um, I was in the justice center for like three days, my junior year of high school. And when I tell you, that was enough time for me to say, oh yeah, nah, I can't do this. I, 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 I can sit in this cell. The thing that's most important to me, my time, my freedom, I was going crazy in there. And I was just in there holding. I, I ain't never did no real time, but those three days book, who? I said, yeah, I ain't doing this. <laughs> I said, no way. It don't take but a minute, man. It don't take but a uh, minute. I know when I was looking at the walls and I see names on the wall, you know, I was here and I go, well, how the hell did I get here? <laughs> I got to get up. I got to get up out of here. It was uh, like a movie, man. I was like, uh-huh. I got to get up out of here. But but I knew uh, I knew I was better than that. I knew I was here for, for more than just to be a number and be locked up in a cell and put away. I, I knew I had more purpose in this life mm-hmm. than that. I really did. Um, what made you, um, you know, make that ultimate change? What what made you see the finally really, really see the light? Was it, uh, of course, that three days, but, you know, after you come out, out you know, after those three days, it's time to, you know, either, you, either you're going to go one way or the other. You got a fork in the road right here. What was the change? You know, it's funny because I, after those three days, I told myself, like, right when they let me out, I said, I'm changing my life. And then I hit that fork in the road on Friday or Thursday, whatever day it was. I went back to my school, trying to go to school, trying to get there, get in. They said, oh, no, player, you expelled. You you can't come here. That walk of shame home was uh, brutal. I went back to the homeboy crib, and I said, all right, F it. This is my life. Left circus behind I went to the hood, and that summer, I mean, I I got shot at every other night. I started selling uh, some stuff, um, and it was bad. I put myself in so many unfortunate situations. I thought it couldn't get any worse when uh, I was sitting in that holding cell for three days. It got a lot worse. Rock bottom, then it went further. And uh, I'm sitting at home, and I get a phone call. My homeboy just got killed. Mm. My homeboy Jarrell, this was the guy that was with me in the um, during the uh, gang fight. When he got killed, it's, it, I went spiraling. I was in car accidents, stolen cars, everything. I, were you? Were you? Did you think you were gonna die? Look, I didn't think I was gonna die, but I was very unsure if I was gonna live. I don't know if that sounds mm. weird or not. Yeah, because, yeah, I you get know, that. When, when you know. When you, when you at a certain age, you say, bro, it's a blessing to make it to 15. Or it's a blessing to make it to 18. Oh, man, once I make it to 21, 24, I never saw myself as an old man because it was always milestones for like 15, 18, 21 or whatnot. And I seen people that were sitting in classrooms with me that didn't reach 15, didn't man. reach 18, man. didn't reach 21. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't see myself as an old man, but... It was like day by day, oh, I'm a, it's a blessing to be here. And yeah. as much as I wanted to change, I kept doing the same dang things. Standing on the corner till midnight, putting myself in unfortunate situations, stealing cars, fighting for no reason. It was just like, it was what? You don't know what the light is if all you know is dark. Uh, uh, you know what? I'm going to add to that um, here in a minute. We got to take a quick break. Um, 
Stick around. Um, we'll be back in a second. Oh, I guess we ain't going to be taking a break. She's a business owner and a former beauty queen. She sure is, and she also performed with the godfather of soul himself. Now, she's changing people's lives. Charmel Huffman doesn't do this for fame or fortune. She says it's what we all should do to help each other. And I was honored to sit down and talk with this incredible superstar for our 2024 Remarkable Women finalists. I am Charmel Huffman, and I am co-owner of Reality of Wrestling. Charmel Huffman's mission with her husband, world-renowned wrestler Booker T, is to change the world of wrestling and change lives. So hopefully their dreams can come true like ours did. Huffman's own dreams began in 1991. I was at Spelman College majored in math, and uh, all of a sudden became Miss Black America. It led her to the godfather of soul. That was an amazing three and a half years of my life. A young girl from Gary, Indiana, and I was able to literally travel the world. You know James Brown was a legend. Then to success with wrestling and induction into the WWE Hall of Fame. My father used to always say to me, to whom much is given, much is asked. And I've always felt that desire to give back. Through the Booker T Fights for Kids Foundation, she's given at college scholarships, backpacks, help single moms, women with breast cancer, and veterans, and even filled 18 wheelers full of hurricane supplies. There's a need, we tend to step in. And we, and we do it quietly. We, we don't want the attention, we just want to help. It's important because somebody took a chance on me. So for me to be nominated for this is just extraordinary. And you can watch Reality of Wrestling, which airs right here on CW39 Sunday mornings at 1 a.m. And to learn more about Charmel Huffman and all that she does, head to our website, CW39.com. We're CW39 Houston. No wait weather and traffic. Boom. Welcome back inside the Hall of Fame. We got scripts talking about life, man. Talking about life, just talking about how dark it can get sometime. And for me, I've been in that dark place. Um, before in my life too you know but i just i refuse to give up man i refuse to give up and i just say i'm gonna just keep walking i'm gonna just keep walking towards the light you know and hopefully finally i i i, I i'll get there and one day i finally made it and uh once i got there i never looked back i just kept going forward um as far as you making it um towards that light um having to go back and go through all of that and see all of that um, put your, and the thing is, you put yourself in that situation mm -hmm. uh, as well. You know what I mean? Uh, you was uh, offered opportunities. Uh, um, you say the ladies tried to help you, and you pretty much uh, uh, passed that to the side just because, you know, peer pressure. You know what I mean? Uh, um, I, I, I talk with young people all the time, and I say, man, you know, for me, when I came out of prison, I say, I know I was a convict. Um, I know I was... Uh, I knew I had that X on my back and I knew I had to prove, you know, to people um, that they could trust me. Um, so I did everything I possibly could um, to, to clean up that dirt. Um, but, 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 but when that man, uh, Bruce Gasarch, I remember um, he, he, off, he offered me his help. And, uh, and I was like, I took it. I took that hand and I held on to it. Man. And, and, uh, and, I, and he put me through wrestling school, helped me um, get my first car. And, um, uh, and I wanted to pay him back. And he said, nah, man, I just want you to pay it forward. I don't want anything. And, um, you know, what would that, uh, you know, big change in your life to finally, you know, you know, put you on the right track? It was right after my uh, friend was shot and killed. That summer, I'm uh, sitting in um, my boy's crib. And I get a phone call from the circus woman. Her name is Jessica, the one that runs the circus show. And they were doing their um, the last performance at Circus Floor. That's the show that I walked out on the very first time with the big white and red circus tent. She said, hey, our last show is tonight. Uh, I would love it if you come come see it. I said, I don't know. Maybe I will. I'm just down. I'm depressed. I'm just like, whatever. I, I'll think about it. And I hung up. And I'm sitting there. And at this point, there's a bunch of guys that are in the circus right now that I still hang out with. But I inspired them to join the circus. But then I left once they got there. But I said, whatever. I went down there, I watched the show. I'm sitting in the audience and I saw the joy on their faces, but I saw all the joy they were having. I saw the, the crowd just laughing and, and, and cheering and whatnot. And then I feel like something in me, I feel like I was the only person in that, uh, in that circus show, in, in the audience. 
it was dark around me and I just saw that light in the ring and I and something in me said, what are you doing? Like these, this woman has given you a way out, a way out of your situation and you're constantly throwing it back in her face. And when I had that epiphany, it was no looking back. I uh, graduated high school, had to go to alternative school. Then I finally graduated high school. Then I, uh, I, did a, uh, I signed up once I graduated in 2010. I took one year off and I trained and got my body right, got my mind right, everything right. And I did a tryout for the National Circuit School in Canada. And I trained my butt off for that entire year. When that tryout came around, I was ready. I was so ready. And it was 150 students the first day. And they had us have these jerseys on. It's very much like a, a WWE tryout had these jerseys with these numbers on. And it was eight o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night. And then we're sitting in the uh, cafeteria. Some woman comes down with this little US bis, US disc, USB disc. She puts it in the TV and all these numbers pop up. If your number on that, uh, on that screen, you made it to the next day. If you didn't, pack your bag because you're going home. By the grace of God, I made it through the entire week. It was a week long audition and they were making cuts every day. I made it to that um, final day, had to wait a month until they gave us the final word if they're going to accept us or not. I got that, um, that call on April Fool's Day, April 1st. And uh, I didn't have an email back then, so they emailed my coach, Jessica. Uh, I just found out my homeboy didn't make it. She called me and said, I'm sorry you didn't make it. I was like, dang. I sat down in my living room. She's like, I'm joking. You made it. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible joke, right? The pure joy from that moment right there, book, I said, everything I do in my life is going to be for my homeboy, but I'm not coming back to St. Louis. Like, I didn't know, I knew where I was headed because I knew where I'd been. I wasn't going back to St. Louis. And yeah. then I get to Montreal, three year program, and pff, struggles, 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 struggles. But like I said, I wasn't going back to St. Louis. And then, honestly, the rest is history. The rest yeah. is history. Beautiful life. Beautiful life after that. Nah, man, um, you um, you struggled. You struggled. You went through it. Um, your story is, you know, so um, parallel to my story. Um, you know, just because, you know, you've gone through a whole lot, that doesn't mean that that's going to define you, um, define who you are in this life, um, define who you inspire, you know, to, to, to get up off that sofa and want to do something or get up out of them street. You know, in them streets and do something. Um, that that that's that's your true um, your true calling uh, more than anything. The wrestling thing, man. You know, of course, you know what I mean. The wrestling thing is what it is. What it is. It's 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 great. It's great being a part of the business. It's the best job. I always say the wrestling business is the best job in the world, man. You ain't gonna find a better job than the oh. wrestling business. Getting a chance to travel around the world, but you got a chance to do that before you got to um, uh, the wrestling business. So um, that right there should have, I think, you know, prepared you uh, for the WWE. I say preparation is the only look. How did that that life, um, you know, on the road, you know, doing that prepare you for that WWE lifestyle? I'm a, I want to touch on something. We can get to it afterwards. Yeah, you, yeah. You talked about um, the wrestling is great. The wrestling is great, but I'm going to tell you right now, there's something that's greater than the wrestling and the wrestling has given me the platform, but we're going to touch upon that after for sure. Cause I, I, that's the most important message I want to get out yeah. uh, doing this podcast. But yeah, man, I, I, I graduated from circus college uh, in 2014 and I started in the first city I traveled to was um, um, not Chateau Vallon. It was somewhere in France. It was just on the uh, border of uh, France um, and I, I have a foggy memory because I've been to over like 20, 30 different countries and in France, I've been to 10, 15 different cities. And so I know France like the back of my hand in many ways, but yeah, it, I was well traveled before I got here. All of the skills and everything that I learned in circus, it made the tryout almost like effort, effortlessly for me because everything transit, uh, transitioned so well. And so just learning the art of punctu punctuality, respect, uh, teamwork, all of these like life skills that I learned from circus are the very much same life skills you need in this, in this business. And 
like all of the crazy stuff that I had to learn on the fly as far as like being a good person, being in the right, making the right decisions or whatever. I learned that in circus. So when I came over, I felt like I was a professional. Like I was very, new. <laughs> I was, I was very new to the business, but you weren't going to catch me like failing drug tests or, or being upset about not being used or saying this business owes me something, you know, Booker, when I knew I was coming to WWE, I was, I had a year left on my circus uh, contract and every, we were traveling around. We went to Connecticut. We went to Montreal, uh, Vancouver, Ottawa, uh, Calgary, and um, and whatnot. I said, they saw me in a the tryout. They said they, they want me in this tryout, but I need to further my uh, my skills. I, 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 I messaged every circuit school from every city that we went to, and I got some training at uh, Test of Strength under Bobby Wagner in, um, in uh, Connecticut, uh, Drew Onyx in Montreal, uh, uh, Pro House uh, Fitness in in Calgary, I was just training all over. Then I sent the video to the like to Matt Bloom, and he was all like, "Oh, this is good." The next thing you know, I got my contract. Everything was in the mail, and next thing you know, I was there in 2020. So I was like, "Oh man, I, good thing I had that mindset of not just saying they want me; they're going to call me when they want." I said, "No, let me go get it." And so that's the mentality I've had since I got here. It doesn't yes. matter about the booking or whatever. What's going to happen is going to happen. I can control what I can control. And you're never going to see me walk through those doors with a upside-down smile. Man, I am blessed to be here, bro. Oh, man. No, I already know, man. Um, I, 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 teach, I teach my students that same thing. Uh, uh, I said, you got to be a, a pro from the beginning. You got <laughs> you to know you're a professional. <laughs> you know what I mean? So now having that mindset uh, coming in the door, um, it's definitely something that you need, um, I think, in this business. Um, all the great ones um, have it. Um, like I say, the, the wrestling uh, thing is it is it is what it is. Um, but what you what you've done before um, wrestling, and, and I think you know what you're doing now as far as trying to you know pay it forward, um, mm -hmm. helping the underprivileged kids, helping the youth. Um, the, the, the kids always say, sometimes you know, I, I was a kid once upon a time myself. And I said, only thing I needed, I think, more than anything, was a pat on the back and somebody to tell me, man, you could do this. You know, yeah, you know, uh, you you could do this. Um, and then I needed somebody to kick me in the butt uh, when I when I wasn't doing it right as well. Yeah. I, I I actually wanted that, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Uh, and that's something that I didn't get. That's something that I had to teach myself. Um, I want I want to let you talk about uh, you know helping the. Uh, the youth, the underprivileged kids. We've got to take one more quick break here real quick. Stick around, guys. Um, we'll be back in a minute. What's up, y'all? It's your man, Booker T, six-time world champion, two-time Hall of Famer, and I'm here with my main man, Brad Gilmore, on the Hall of Fame podcast. And today, we're talking about something that's been a game-changer for us, and that's HelloFresh. That's right, Booker. Whether you're looking to save money, eat better, or stress less in the new year, HelloFresh has got you covered. We're talking about farm-fresh ingredients, chef-crafted recipes, and the best part, it's all delivered right to your doorstep. You know, Brad, I used to stress about meal planning, especially with my busy schedule. But with HelloFresh, man, I'm whipping up quick, tasty meals in no time. And my favorite has got to be their 15-minute recipes. Man, who knew I could cook a gourmet meal that fast? Absolutely, Book. But let's talk about variety. HelloFresh has over 45 dinner options each week. So that's right. There's going to be no more recipe boredom. Plus, they've got calorie smart and protein smart options. Perfect for keeping those New Year's resolutions in check. And you know, Brad, as a family man, I'm sitting down for dinner with my crew and it's important. Hello, fresh, quick and easy meals have made that reality. Even on the busiest nights, it's just convenient. It's bringing the family together. And don't forget, breakfast fans, HelloFresh is hooking you up, the listeners of the Hall of Fame podcast, with free breakfast for life. That's right, a free breakfast item with every delivery. Now, that's a sweet deal to wake up to. Y'all heard it here first. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Booker Free and use the code, man, Booker Free to get your free breakfast for life. Remember, one breakfast item per box while your subscription 
is active. Oh, yeah, man. That's HelloFresh.com slash Booker Free with the code Booker Free. Don't miss out on America's number one meal kit. Join us in making cooking fun, easy, and absolutely delicioso. It's HelloFresh. You got it. Oh, yeah. Can you dig it? It's time to get your champagne wishes and caviar dreams. Welcome inside the Hall of Fame. Now, can you dig that? Welcome back inside the Hall of Fame. Um, got scripts here inside the Hall of Fame. Getting a little champagne wishes, caviar dreams, but I know you got to get out of here. He's got work to do. Uh, he's a busy, busy man. But I do, I do, I do want to, I do want to let you talk about, uh, you know your uh, efforts and, you know, helping the underprivileged. Yes, sir. I mean, you touched on it um, early on. You said your coach told you uh, when you asked how can you repay him, he said pay it forward. I asked my coach the exact same thing, Booker. Uh, my circus coach, uh, Warren Bacon, acrobatic coach, he was the man that helped me pay for my flight, uh, my, my room and board when I got to the tryout and everything. Always just been a big proponent in my life of um, just – helping me. And so I said, man, how do I repay you? He said, um, my job is complete. Uh, you gave, I've given him the son that he always wanted and just pay it forward. And so throughout my entire journey in the circus, I always go back to St. Louis, help the kids. I teach the kids. I give back to the community in that way. And, um, you know, when I left Cirque du Soleil, I was searching for a bigger purpose. And then I came to WWE and I said, oh, man, this is the best time to be um, a wrestler. This is the best time to be a part of the company. The company has evolved from just a wrestling show. It's much more than that. And I said, you know, the wrestling is great. I would love to be world champion one day, tag team champion, whatever. I would love to be champion in this company uh, one day. I actually am 24-7, but. That's another year there. But yeah. I would love to be champion in this company. But the thing I love more is I want to be that light for every kid in the world that doesn't have it. So I'm like, use me, abuse me in, in the best way possible. Put me in front of all of the little kids that want to be inspired. Take me to all the different communities and just let me speak to these kids. Because all these kids need book is someone that looks like them and that's gone through the same things as them to say, you can do it. Yeah. You can be anything you want to be. They, we, I've had people come to my school, but they didn't look like me. They didn't. They they weren't. They, they weren't walking those streets like me. I'm like, we we saw our first black president, and now every little black kid in the world can say, "Oh man, I can really be president of the United States." Representation is key. Yeah. And so, yeah. that's that's what it's all about. Like, I can care less about what I accomplish in the ring. It would be great. But that's not where my priority lies. My priority is to be that father figure, that that light, that 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 thing for so many kids. Uh, I'm in the process. I just started finished writing everything up. My uh, organization that I'm starting, it's called RBB, Rise Beyond Borders, where our mission is to empower at risk youth with the tools and resources they need to break the cycle of adversity and create a life map to a brighter future. Booker, that's all I want to do in this world. Like, once you, like, I, I live comfortably. My, 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 my fiance, my kids, they have everything they need in the world. I have everything I need in the world. I don't need more. I just need to be able to do stuff for people that don't have the luxuries that I have right now, the luxuries that I didn't have as a kid. And so that's what that organization is going to be. It's going to be opening these kids' eyes and putting them around people and around different professions to where, they say, I didn't even know there was an option. Yeah. Because the kid, I didn't know circus was an option. I didn't think circus was gonna take me oh, yeah. all around the world. Mm -hmm. Like even with wrestling, like I'm like, oh, this is a dream that I never knew I could even achieve when I was a kid. Yeah. And now I'm here. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't able to see myself as a 25-year-old boy or 18-year-old boy until I got there. But once I got out of that cycle, I see myself as a 70, 80-year-old man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's incredible, Booker. Yeah, I, from not being able to go two streets over because of rival gangs, I was traveling the world as an acrobat. Hey, man, you know uh, that's for uh, 
you know, believing in yourself, putting in the work, you know, and knowing that, you know, it's still yet so much work yet to be done. Mm -hmm. um, the journey is just uh, beginning. Um, yep. and, and for you to be able to, you know, share that story with me, man, it's, it's very, very important um, for young people, especially young people of color, like, like you and I, to be able to see that, you know, with a little bit of hard work, um, being in the right place at the right time, having someone believe in me, I might get break up out of this yeah. uh, this cycle. And the thing is, we hear about it all the time. We hear about, you know, these um, kids in Chicago, um, these kids in St. Louis, um, the gang bangers. Um, and I always say, you know, if you got a, a gang banger, he could be the leader of the gang. I um, mean, he have a little baby uh, with, with, with his girl. Um, don't think for a second that he don't want that kid to go to college, finish school, go to college and get a great job. But if those opportunities aren't there for him, they're going to mess it right into the gang and say, baby, let's roll um, and do what we got to do. That's just the nature of the beast. That's the lifestyle in the hood. So for me, man, I really, really, truly appreciate, um, you know, you kicking it with me and giving me some time. Um, you got a comic book coming out, right? You talk about doing a comic book. I couldn't even read in high school and write in high school. And now I have a comic book. Uh, I have an autobiography that's in audio form, audible. Uh, I have a TV show that the pilot episode is finished. I started writing another um, a, a movie for a short film that uh, me and my boy want to film. Uh, two children's books, comic book, all book. Uh, Cirque du Soleil artist, WWE wrestler, author, and I had six Fs and a D in high school. It doesn't matter what you go through or whatever. It's about the now. And like you said, a little bit of hard work. And you can have anything in this world. Yeah, yeah, man. I appreciate that, man. How can your fans um, get a hold to you, man, and, um, you know, chop it up with you? I mean, you can reach me on all social media platforms. You have uh, scripts.wwe on uh, Instagram. Um, same one on Twitter and TikTok is the uh, same thing as well. Oh, oh. Yeah. hey man, there again, man. I just want to thank you uh, for stepping inside the Hall of Fame. Getting your champagne wishes and caviar dreams, man. <laughs> Dropping it like it's hot, letting everybody know, man. Um, if um, if scripts can make it, um, if Booker T can make it out of our situation that we went through, I lost my dad when I was 10 months old. Lost my mom when I was 13. Scripps lost his mom when he was three years old. Didn't even know his dad, but he he rose to uh, you know success in this lifetime. In this lifetime, guys, if we could do it, you can do it too. I just want to give you guys that um, before we get up out of here. Always, man, uh, Brad for, for the heavy lifting, um, the fans um, uh, for. for stepping in getting your champagne which is caviar dream we love you guys and until next time like i always say peace we love you we out uh -huh. <laughs>